Hey everyone, it's Jim from Vows and More, an online vintage tube store. And today in Tube Lab number 27, we're going to take a first look at my prototype E80CC preamp and how it sounded with the Wilsonton R8. But first, caution everyone, electronics and tube amplifiers can have very high voltages present, which can be lethal. Exercise extreme caution when working around them. Always consult a professional technician when in doubt. And if you're enjoying these videos, please hit the like button and subscribe. First off, some housekeeping. You may have noticed some ads appearing at the beginning of my videos. And no, this wasn't my idea. YouTube has decided unilaterally to monetize my channel. Hmm. Okay, let's jump right in and take a look at my newest prototype. It's designed around the amazing sounding E80CC tube. Up till now, I've only been able to hear the E80CC as a substitute for the 12AU7 in circuits designed for the 12AU7. And for a long time, I wanted a preamp designed around the higher spec and frankly better sounding E80CC. And this is the result. In this episode, we're going to do an overview of the design. Next week, we'll go deeper and look at the tube data sheet talk about the design development, the schematics, and how to lay out the grounding to avoid ground loops and the resulting noise. Let's have a look. Let's pull the lids off, shall we? Now at the heart of any amplifier is the power supply. And in this case, we've got this nice little R core. And the beauty of this thing is its compact size, its affordability, its low noise, and it's got a dual secondary. And what that means is we can have two separate power supplies. So in fact, this is a dual power supply and dual mono preamp. So it's basically two amplifiers inside one package. And what that gets us is an amazing stereo separation, and that gives us an amazing sound stage. Now with, of course, a dual power supply, we have dual chokes, dual large filter caps. Let's just pull one of these tubes and take a quick look at it. There's actually a tube lab talking, uh, reviewing the E80CC specifically. These are Tungsram. These are the most commonly available and affordable E80CCs. And frankly, they, they're great sounding tubes. And there's enough of them around that you can get a new old stock matched pair affordably. Phillips, who uh, developed the E80CC way back in 1952, makes the gold standard. They make something called the SQ Special Quality, or they made, they're no longer available, new, gold pins, and um, they, they cost easily twice as much, three times as much as the tongues rams, and they're just not that easy to find. I have some, and I've listened to them both, and frankly, well, I would say that the the edge definitely goes to the Phillips tubes. But some people actually prefer the Tungs Ram because they're, they're a smoother sounding tube. Uh, whereas the Phillips tube is a little more analytical, a little bit more detailed. They're very close though to each other. Okay, what else have we got on the top? We've got a pair of RCA ins. So a switch just tells us which, wherever it's pointed is, is our input. And I only have two high quality inputs. I've got a, a good quality digital source and a good quality phono in and that's all I need. I like things nice and simple. Of course we've got a, a left tube and a right tube. Over here we just have a pair of RCAs going out. Here we've got a DC jack and that's for a switch mode power supply or SMPS and it's on its own switch of course and all of those are is uh, little power supplies that we use to, to power up things like um, our laptops, for example. But the beauty of, of bringing a, a power brick or a power block or a switch, switch mode power supply, whatever you want to call, in is that we get nice, clean DC for the filaments. You can run filaments or heaters, as some people call them, at, on AC, and there's nothing wrong with that, particularly in a power amp. But in a preamp, we want, I want my uh, preamp to be as quiet as possible. Because remember, it's at the, 
fairly early on in the signal chain, and later on the power amp is going to amplify any noise that we introduce at this stage. It's particularly important with phono preamps, which have very high gain tubes in them, like the 12AX7. And so with DC, we, we hopefully get a quieter uh, filament because if you put a lot of noise onto the filament of a tube, the cathode is literally wrapped right around it. And you can induce quite easily um, noise on that AC line or on that DC if the DC um, heater supply is noisy onto the signal of the circuit, which is bad. Okay, let's take a quick look at the back. Noise is bad, folks. <laughs> it really detracts. Okay, so here's this all-in-one inlet that I really like to use these days. It's got an IEC inlet for the power cord. It's got a built-in fuse holder for your primary and a nice little lit switch. It's not plugged in, of course. And you can even actually, depend on how you have this thing oriented, you can reverse, pull out the switch and reverse it. You just got to remember to reverse the wiring. Otherwise, the switch stays lit the whole time. Um, and don't ask me how I know that, folks. On the front, we've got a nice little, I put a nice milled solid aluminum volume control. Um, and when I first started, I actually put them on the tops because I wanted the whole chassis to be able to separate the whole circuit from the chassis quickly and easily for changes and stuff. And then I thought, you know, it'd be nice to have something in front of my, my standard amp designs. And the volume knob, really, it looks quite good on the front. I recess it, but you may have noticed it's not on here. And the reason for that is this is still a prototype, folks. And I don't knob up a design until it's going to sit in the system for some length of time. So we're not quite there yet. I'm getting close, though. I was thinking about putting the knob on today. Okay, inside, let me just get a little prop under here. We've got dual power supply boards, and if you if you were watching my 6 or 12 SN7 preamp, which is very similar, um, you may notice that the boards, these boards, are a lot less cluttered, and that's because I ended up with some ground loop issues with the design, with this design, and I ended up doing a whole bunch of cleanup, and we're, we'll talk about that next in the next episode. So we've got a very simple power supply board. Proto, I use proto boards for prototypes. It's just so easy and quick. And then from there we go into two, the two preamplifier boards here. And I also use a proto board that I carry. I really like these boards. They're dual sided. They'll take a seven, eight, or nine uh, pin PCB socket. And they've got two spots for every pin. So they're really flexible. You can solder directly on the outs or you can uh, go ahead and put these really nice mechanical fasteners. And I like building prototypes like this because I can, in two or three minutes, I can pull a board, can make a change, and drop it right back in without desoldering any of the connections to the board. Just makes life so much easier, especially when you're, you know you're going to take it apart a number of times. So here's your right channel, there's your left channel. Over here we've got a Blue Alps 100K pot with its own little board and its connectors as well. Let's just take a look at the RCA and it's, let me just tilt it up so you can see it. Look at that rat's nest and that's just to bring in two channels or two inputs. And of course we feed back to, um, to a right and a left into the volume control. So, um, Right here is the center takeoff on the switch. I like using these these heavy duty switches. Uh, these are way overrated for what I'm doing. This is a 15 amp switch because I want a large, low resistance contact surface. I hate rotary switches. I don't want to see losses to my audio signal or, you know, fuzzy connections. It was, I, you know, I was an audiophile going back decades, um, all the way back, in fact, to my teens. So I can go back 40 years, and rotary switches were our bane back then. They'd get noisy, the contacts wouldn't quite um, click in properly. These things, they're so rock solid. 
I, I always check to see what my resistance on them, and they're, there's no resistance. They're bang on. 100% contact all the time. Okay. Um, and over here you can see you can see the the DC jack bringing our, our filament in. And of course there's the switch right there. Okay. So how did it how did it sound? That's the big question. Well, in short, brilliant. Absolutely brilliant. Now, I'm feeding it into the pre-in on my Wilsonton R8, and it makes a significant improvement in the R8. What? How is that possible? An extra piece of gear should, in theory, make the R8 sound worse, shouldn't it? No, many amplifiers like the R8, which is a very simple integrated amplifier, can benefit from a quality preamp feeding it. I remember one of my gurus, Paul from PS Audio, talking about this in one of his many YouTubes and saying it shouldn't be so, but in many cases it is. So what are the improvements? Dynamics definitely improved big time. I always felt the R8 was a tad too tame or flat. Detail is amazing now as well, and with detail almost always comes an excellent sound stage. Now, the R8 already had a nice sound stage. This just made it that much better. But the dynamics are what I love. What I mean by dynamics is, is how quick the amp responds to rapid changes in the music. A simple example is when a singer brings it up a notch. The vocals are already our focus, and the singer deliberately wants to get our attention. And they do that with a rapid change in volume. A good system will respond to that in a quick, dynamic way that conveys the sound and the feeling. Maybe the addition of the pre is adding a wee bit of something that wasn't in the original recording. Or more than likely, it's just accentuating what is there. I don't care. My rule is if it sounds good, it is good. And... Before we go, let's take a look at some of the neat stuff that came in. Let's just clear the deck. A whole bunch of these came in. And this is a big socket for the 211 tube. It's, they're all vintage. They were all used, so they've been lightly refurbished. They're made by this old-time company that goes way back to the beginnings of radio, E.E. E. Johnson Company, from Waseca, um, Minneapolis, I believe. Or is that Minnesota? I'm not sure. They have big ceramic bases. All the hardware is either plated um, brass or plated copper. And in fact, even the... The tube socket itself, the holder, is a piece, a large piece of, of brass tube that's nickel plated. Isn't that pretty? Now they're not perfect, but what I did was I, I wanted to refurbish them enough that they would look good. All the contact surfaces are clean, and the pins. Can you see the, the, the pin grabbers or whatever they're called, the contacts. They actually have to be aligned after you take this thing apart and clean it. So I have I've actually aligned them all up. But let's just take a look at the these. Aren't these amazing? This is actually a 311 tube. It's the same as the 211. I think there's even a 411. These suckers, they they can dissipate 75 watts. I mean, they're look at the size of this triode. Which that that means that in single-ended class A, you can you can generate 25 watts of output. Isn't that amazing? I think everybody needs at least a few projects that they they put on the on the list before they die and get too old. And this is I'd love to build a pair of mono blocks using using a single one of these these puppies in each one. Now to get that. 25 watts of output, you've got to have a thousand volts on the plate, a full kilovolt. Can you imagine? Anyways, let's just, 
I'll just show you, it's really neat how these things load. It's not surprising they have a heavy duty socket given how much voltage is going to be present. So you, they go in like this and they twist and snap. Let me see if you can see the pins actually. They actually, let's see if I can get it on camera there for you. There we go. See how the pin just locks right into the slot? Anyways, there's a bunch of these in the store. I don't have the big 211s and 311s. I've got a number of these came in used. They're not tested yet and they're not in the store. Uh, I actually have to build a major modification to my power tube tester to, to test them. My biggest, um, my fluke power supply, my big bench power supply only goes up to 550. But I have a feeling the testing parameters at 550 volts will be fine to, to get a good number off of these tubes. Interestingly enough, my smaller power supply, my HP, which goes up to 500 volts, you can string them um, together if you have another one, and you can actually get a thousand volts out of the unit. It's designed to work that way. So if I ever find another one, I might grab it. Imagine that a thousand volts on the bench. You got to be careful, folks. That's that's one hand <laughs> tied to the pocket. <laughs> Time <laughs> and some isolating gloves, perhaps. Anyways, what else came in? Some used melts tubes, 6SL7s, or equivalent, exact equivalents to 6SL7s. A bunch of these came in. Uh, as many of you know, I'm, I'm absolutely in love with these 1950s mil-spec metal-based melts tubes. Melts stands for Moscow Electric Light Company. And at one time, they were one of the largest electronics manufacturers in the world. They were, of course, based in Moscow. And um, I had a bunch of new old stock, um, really beautiful mint looking tubes. And of course they went really fast. Um, and I think I might even have just one matched pair left of them. But now I've got quite a few matched pairs that are used. They're a little less expensive. They're still testing really close to new old stock. But you know, the bases and the pins and some of the logos are gone. The bases are a little bit beat up. Some of them have been to see. Um, I mean, a tube from the 1950s, I think the earliest one I've seen is 1951. So what is that? That's almost, that is 70 years old. Imagine that. That's ancient. Anyways, um, this, this is a fun story. I'll keep it brief. I was looking for uh, some more 6SL7s of these melts tubes. And I inquired of a, a bunch of wholesalers all of them in the Ukraine or Russia, and one of the one of the guys got back to me, this was a Sunday, and he said, when I get into the warehouse tomorrow, I'll, I'll have a look and see what we've got in stock. I'll let you know. And he found a, a nice bunch of new old stock, 6SL7s, and some 6SN7s. And uh, he, uh, he gave me some numbers, and I said, I said, well, why don't you give me a price for them all? He got back to me. He said, "That's going to be expensive, Jim." <laughs> and I gulped and I said, "Yup." But this is a this is an opportunity to buy some new old stock 1950s tubes that are glorious. Uh, so I, it's the single largest tube purchase I've ever made, and um, the bulk of the order is actually underway. I I bought a sample from him, and they were beautiful tubes. Those are all gone, and I've got. Uh, the bulk of the order is still to come in. And it's a crapshoot, folks. You never know. You know, half the tubes could be bad. They could all be good. Normally, I allow for about 10% bad. That doesn't necessarily mean that they won't physically work, but I can't sell them. If they're, they they don't match up good, they've got some cracks in the base or something stupid like that, um, they're missing a guide pin, I'll use them in my own system, but... Um, I can't charge people money for tubes like that. Okay, well, if you stay to the end and listen to all my stories, here's some discount codes for you. Remember, I've got flat rate $20 shipping around the world, and um, if you spend $150 or more after discount, the shipping's on me, folks. Stay safe, everyone. This is Jim from Valves and More signing off. Cheers, everyone.